G'day guys, it is the coach here. We are talking all things slaves to darkness. We have a STD masterpiece ready to go. <laughs> I am <laughs> we are gonna talk uh Knights of the Empty Throne, uh something that I didn't think we'd be talking about, but here we are with the two-time Australian master Dave Kerr. I was gonna call you Dave the Master Kerr, but unfortunately. You did get pipped last time, though. We won't add salt to that wound. But you <laughs> have recently gone five and one, yes, five and one, with the Knights of the Empty Throne. So I thought I want to pick your brain to understand. This is a real-life tournament, by, by the way, guys. Uh, this is not a tabletop simulator. This is legit Warhammer on the table. And uh, before we kind of get to the list, Dave, welcome back. It's been a while. Hope you're doing well. What's going on up in uh, in Queensland? Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, it's it has been a while, you know. Everyone's everyone's kind of been in their own states lockdowns, and um, thankfully up in Queensland we've been fairly free to play in events. So yeah, we've um we've had a few real life events, uh, which has been good. It's kept me uh kept my finger on the pulse, you know, rolling dice. No, it's been really cool to have, uh, at least in Sydney as well, I know there's been local events. Uh, you and I are going up to an event, uh, down to an event, literally around this time next month. Uh, so we're pretty very privileged to play Warhammer, but you played in like a 50-odd player event. So um, yep. that's no laughing matter. That's quite large, at least in in COVID kind of terms. Yeah, in COVID era, 50 is a, a big event. Uh, Man, and it was, it, it was really good too. It, t it takes us back to like 2017, 2018. Like, like I would fly up to RCGT because it was a fifty play, a fifty player event. It was massive. Like, oh, I've got to get to this fifty player event. Uh, and then yeah. we kind of got really lucky with the hundreds. You know, Brizhammer, my event. Uh, you know, fifties were nothing. And then we kind of got to two hundreds, but uh, fifty is a big event. But you did six rounds, which I thought was um, fascinating. Yeah, that was um, that was a TO call, I guess. At, at the end of the event, uh, we kind of had a vote, and I think everyone, it was pretty unanimous. We were just like, nah, let's do five. Um, six is a bit of a slog because, uh, you know, by the time you finish your fifth, you're like, eh, we would have been finishing right now and, uh, you know, wrapping up and getting back. But, you know, six, um, I think you need like 64 people to get an, uh, like you an undefeated winner. We ended up getting an undefeated winner anyway, but six rounds. It's um, it was definitely a bit of endurance, but I got to at least play like everyone who was up the top. I had a crack at. I was watching your results carefully. Um, being so, you were obviously for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Dave's up in Queensland. I'm in New South Wales, so there's a bit of distance between us. So I couldn't get to that event. Uh, actually, there was I think there was a hard border that might have been stopping us. But uh, I was yep. watching your event. I was watching you play some of the big dogs, and um, so you, you know, Scrub. You know, this this night to the empty throne has not gone through a bunch of beasts uh, beasts of chaos. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> you have gone through some some of the, the tougher battles. So. I'm really interested to understand your particular build, what drew you to this army. Um, and I know being that you went five and one in this last event and in a, mo in a month's time you come into an event with me, um, what's going to change as well? So that's kind of like the structure of today. And um, I might kick it off with the rules. So, like, tell me a little bit about if I was an STD player or – Maybe I, I maybe I'm a chaos player, and I'm interested in moving into Slaves to Darkness. Um, what's the appeal? What what drew you? Because you are quite competitive. You have played in some really interesting lists, and uh, obviously, there's so many options. Why why Slaves to Darkness, and why Knights of the Empty Throne? Um, I guess I'll start with why Slaves to Darkness because. I, I am a competitive player and I don't think that Slaves generally is a particularly competitive book. It can play, but it, it's not going to compete with the upper echelons. So I guess the reason that – the thing that drew me to it is um, that Get Started box that came out, you know, the Warriors and the Knights um, and that Karkadrak guy, they looked awesome, so – I just, I got, I got a box and I was like, sweet, I'm going to paint these up. I'm going to do a real classic, like blacks and reds. And I painted it. I'm like, 
damn, I love this. So it kind of rolled on from there. And I, I did I did try it for a while, and it, it was before the um, Wrath of the Everchosen came out with the, the cool new stuff. Um, and I played in an event where the old, before the FAQ, so the Nurgle, the Nurgle Demon Prince was bouncing D3 back on every six. And um, <laughs> that was... That I, was I, remember that, I remember that Nurgle Demon <laughs> Prince. You would see multiples of them in lists. They were uh, uh, OP. It was, it was crazy. I, I remember this poor bloke. He ran nine Gore Grunters into a unit of five Chaos Knights and all of them died uh, from their attacks and then from Battleshock. Um, it killed like something like six pigs just on the bounce backs because I had them in the plague touched as well. So I was bouncing D3 back on six to hit D3 back in a six to wound. Anyway, that's all gone. That that's FAQ. behind us. That was FAQ. I can see people are like jumping on their phone right now looking at their, oh, where's <laughs> yeah, his yeah. demon prince? Where's his demon prince? Guys, it has changed. It has slightly yeah. changed. It's not as good as it was. Still good, but not as good. So I, I guess I was really drawn to the aesthetic of the, like, the classic chaos warrior, like, uh, Northman. Like, I, I think it's a really cool vibe. And just that unmarked kind of look and that, that chaos, that, that's what drew me in. So while being competitive, uh, it aesthetically and kind of thematically drew me into Slaves. Um, and then uh, I shifted around and because during COVID, I was like, oh, there's nothing really kind of that we're working for. So I played a heap of different armies, but I've come back to them and I'm really enjoying them. And um, the Knights of the Empty Throne, it's just, I mean, those Varangar models, again, they're amazing. Being able to make them the centerpiece of your army and being able to play around them and them actually working and playing how you would think they would in uh, kind of the law or thematically, you know, like a unit of chaos lords busting out, like that's awesome. And Knights of the Empty Throne, again, appeals to my competitive side. I think that it is the only real option for a competitive Slaves to Darkness list. Okay, okay. There's some, there's, there's some big calls there and we'll go to your list and we'll have a look at how you're building it. I have only had the pleasure of playing Varangard as support to Archeon. So uh, I, when I played at, uh, there was a November tournament not too long ago uh, down in Canberra. I got to play uh, Craig Anderson, who is a massive, he's been running Varigard since there was the Ever Chosen book, well before Slaves to Darkness. And uh, I'm used to playing four, four units of, of Varangard, you know, with, uh, with Archeon, but I've never, I've never played against a Varangard without Archeon. So I'll be curious to see your build and kind of curious to see how you talk about this list. But I I fully appreciate where you're coming from. I really like um, the Slaves aesthetic. Uh, something that people might not know is I do have a lot of old Hammer and one thing I do have is old Chaos Warriors, the old Halberd when they were metal Halberds that come with the plastic kit. And um, I paid them my blue because back in the days I was a Zench Slanish combo army. But I'm all for that black and gold or black and like just classic uh, undivided yeah. colors. So, um, like brass red, it's a good yeah. scheme. And they're good. Like, I really like it. And the Kakadrak and, and, and some of these models are just, just badass. And obviously, you can bring in uh, models from all of the Chaos factions, which I think is uh, a wonderful yeah. addition. And it might actually lead us to actually talking about the rules. So instead of going in through every single rule that you've got here, because we are drawing from uh, not just the Slaves to Darkness Battle Tome, but this is also uh, using Wrath of the Ever Chosen, which was that supplement book that came out, I think, early 2020. So um, so I think, guys, if you're looking for Wrath, uh, uh, Knights of the Empty Throne, it isn't in your Slaves to Darkness Battle Tome. It is a part of uh, Wrath of the Ever Chosen. But... To get things started, talk to me about – talk. To, so, obviously, first off, uh, Knights of the Empty Throne is a damned legion, so uh, one of the big things that Wrath of the Everchosen did was give us some additional damned legions. Um, there was, like, the the Drowned the drowned Men. There was, like, a whole bunch of them. Yeah, Legion but, of Chaos Ascendant. That was really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of really cool ones in there, you know, especially, like, um, that's kind of where – uh, Black Kings have really taken a form of their own because of that book. But 
Talk to me about the marks. When you were building your Knights of the Empty Throne, how were you thinking about the marks? Were you thinking about battalions, then marks? Were you thinking, like, do all of these particular marks come into play or is there some that kind of synergize better with than others with this kind of particular build? Um, right, yeah. So when I looked at marks and how to do this, I, I, I was just looking at what, the best is now slaves to darkness is an army that buffs and combos off its heroes it's very kind of i guess maybe mediocre unit profiles and stat lines but the amount of buffs and layers you can put on there really kind of um, brings these mediocre units <clears throat> and makes them shine so there's a few different things in, I specifically chose the Nurgle keyword, and again, I'm, I'm going to throw it out there and say that I think the Nurgle keyword is the best one. Um, so I think they have the best auras coming from themselves. Um, they also have the best uh, synergies with the War Shrine, which is one of your key pieces in Slaves to Darkness. And then as well, I think they fit uh, the Plague Touch Battalion, which is one of the best battalions um, going around. Like it can compete with uh, other books who have great battalions. Like that is that is a real kind of shining light in the book is the Plague Touch. So that's essentially why I picked Nurgle over any of the others. Now, that's not to say the others don't have some kind of play, but, um, yeah, I think Nurgle allows you to play quite – aggressively while at the same time being very defensive. So for anyone who's picking up Slaves to Darkness for the first time, um, any of your Slaves to Darkness heroes uh, as well as your units can gain a keyword, whether it's going to be a mark of Corn, Zench, Nurgle, Slanish or Undivided. And a general can also, when, if, when your general is marked, you get additional rules as well. So uh, in the example of what Dave's talking about, so Dave, uh, spoiler alert, is running the Plague Touch Warband in his five and one list that we, we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, or maybe it might be a couple more minutes, but uh, that's the first list we're going to talk about. With Nurgle, what you're going to get is um, if the unmodified wound roll for the attack is made by melee weapon, um, is a, a Slaves to Darkness Nurgle unit, wholly within 12 of any friendly models with the ability is a six. So if we're rolling a six, um, that's a, that's, so if we're rolling six to wound, uh, well, uh, add one to the damage uh, inflicted by that uh, attack. In addition, if the model is a general, subtract one to the hit rolls uh, by missile weapons that target within 12 inches of the model. So getting a bit of melee defense, as well as you're getting some additional damage when you roll those sixes to wound. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's the shooting. It's the shooting that you're getting more defense ag against. And um, in the meta right now, uh, as I'm sure everyone knows, there is a real kind of kick towards shooting. Like it, it's quite powerful to be able to project damage across the board without taking it back. Um, and you've also got easier movement phase with shooting, etc. So that. Um, negative one to shooting is actually really important, especially for those, as I said, because your slaves' armies are generally comboing buffs off characters. Those characters near your general with lookout Sarah now negative two to hit, mm. um, which is 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 pretty big. It's making a four plus, a six plus, et cetera. It's just going to make things, and there is a lot of shooting, whether you're talking about Lumineth with their uh, Wardens, whether you're talking about Caradron Overlords as a, a whole army, uh, Cities of Sigma. I know when I took my Gargans down to this November event, the only losses that I had with my Gargans were those really heavy shooting armies. So uh, yeah. thinking about how you might respond or that negative one to hit might make things less attractive or uh, might make something that was going to die not die or you know there, there's there's some things you can build around that so it's probably very good in the meta right now you know rewind 12 it months is. ago maybe maybe it wouldn't be it wouldn't be as popular or it wouldn't be as strong but right now there's yep. just so much shooting there is lumineth's a different beast though we can't put lumineth in there they don't care if they hit or not they're just looking for five true. and sixes true they're just fishing <laughs> for those models though yeah it those, doesn't help those. against those guys 
those freaking jerks. Um, if, <laughs> before I move into the Wrath of the Ever Chosen, um, is there any other marks that, let's say you weren't going to take the Plague Touched, is there any other marks that you think would be good for your style of list? Um, any, or, or do you think that just Nurgle is just like the one right now, at least in your mind? Well, I think Undivided from Memory gets an after save. Uh, yeah, you ignore that, you ignore the the wound on a, on a six. Yeah, so that's you, your war shrine, which you're gonna take anyway, is essentially filling that role. So I I do like Slanesh with perhaps like a Marauder heavy kind of list, uh, smashing out those extra hits. But then that's probably better in Slanesh itself. Um, <laughs> And, and this is this is this is the complication that Slaves to Darkness has with like Cities of Sigma. Cities of Sigma, you go down a rabbit hole that you know does this list work better here or here, and then what if I tweak it here, and it, it becomes an absolute schmozzle. But things like um, if you took the Aura of Corn, uh, you can reroll hit rolls of one. Uh, I guess saving yourself some CPs instead of having to spend them. Uh, you've yeah. got yourself uh, Zench, so you can reroll armor saves of one. Uh, you've got Nurgle we just talked about. Slanesh is, uh, if the unmodified hit roll is uh, is a six. six. Uh, obviously, obviously, we're wearing buff ranges here, guys, but um, you basically score two hits instead of one. I could see having a squeeze at your list that we're going to go through, maybe Slanesh. Maybe that might that might work quite well, maybe. Slanesh could. I think I think Corn's probably the next one you're going to go to because Corn can get the plus one to wound as well. Like you, you're more kind of looking at what you can get out of slaves that you can't get in other places. So like rerolling ones to save, yeah, cool, but you can get that out of a Mystic Shield. So I guess that's how I look at it is like these generic abilities that it's giving me, I can get that from somewhere else and then have these extra abilities anyway. So I guess that's probably a bit of an insight into how I'm looking at it. So I think Nurgle's the best, and then Corn you probably want to look at after that. Yeah, and uh, you know, for, first, I thank you very much as well, Poet, for uh, for for your donation. That's um, pretty amazing. And he's asked a question as well around, uh, you know, like obviously one thing that Plague Touch does really well in your list is bring your it brings your drops down quite significantly. Uh, and I guess if you were going to lean into Corn, you could bring in something like a Blood Secretor, uh, and obviously some things like that. But you are. I mean, we can talk about Italians and talk about some other alternative builds, but I guess for what you're doing, your list, um, the way you've built it is quite synergistic and I, I really like it. Yeah. If you are going corn, yeah, Blood Secretors are great. They're always great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any any type of uh, annoying people in the magic phase as well is going to be a big bonus. But let's talk Empty Throne. Let's talk actually about the Knights of the Empty Throne because this is in your Wrath of the Ever Chosen. You get uh, some additional things and some quite interesting things when you look at it. And um, probably the big thing that you get is going to be the fact that you're, uh, if you if you are Knights of the Empty Throne, so you're Slaves of Darkness and you take the, then you take the Sub Allegiance or the Damned Legion of Knights of the Empty Throne. Uh, if you've given your army Knights of the Empty Throne keyword, uh, friendly Knights of the Empty Throne Baron Guard, gain the hero keyword. Uh, if Archeon is not in your army. Okay, so interesting. So all of a sudden, any unit of Varen Guard that I bring is a hero. Uh, and I also get a command trait. Uh, sorry, sorry, the unit with a keyword can have a command trait or artifact. Okay, interesting. Uh, you will, But you don't get Lookout Sir. So you don't get Lookout Sir, probably no surprise. <laughs> a big block yep. of Varen Guard. Um, that a Knights of the Empty Throne Varengard unit with the hero keyword can only have the command traits or artifact listed opposite. So I can't take anything else. I can't take the command traits from Slaves to Darkness. I can't take no. artifacts from somewhere else. Oh, hang on. That's all right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I just got a, a call through because I'm using my mobile. While, um, while, while Dave fixes his camera, what you also get <laughs> is uh, the Unmatched Conquerors, which is a command trait. Uh, you can use this command ability uh, in, at the end of your charge phase. If you do so, pick one enemy unit that, can, uh, that controls an objective within 12. 
uh, roll a dice, so ro sorry, roll, uh, roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit. For each three plus at the end of the battle round, the number of models in that unit is counted for two. Okay, you can talk me through that. What, what is that big block of text? But first off, artifacts, yep. command traits have to come from the Knights of the Empty Throne list. They do, and they are really good. So you don't want to not take them. So, for instance, that stops taking you stops you from taking plate of perfect protection on your unit of Varen guards who are ignoring one rend, which is pretty cool. But you can't do it, and I don't think I would if I could anyway, because the command traits and the artifacts for Empty Throne are great. Right, um, so it's not like a tax. It's not like a tax where you've got to like make a big sacrifice. It actually works quite well. It it makes the list what it is, actually, those command traits and artifacts. Um, so it, I think without them, this list wouldn't be anywhere near as kind of uh, dangerous as it is. And this this here, this, um, this sub-allegiance, Knights of the Empty Throne, is what makes this Slaves to Darkness list work so well. <clears throat> Talking so, about this command ability, this, this this obviously is a big block of text and it might sound a little bit confusing. So I've got a unit of, of uh, I've got a hero or a unit of Varen guard. Uh, if they're within an objective, I roll a three plus at the end of the battle round and then it counts as more models. Is that what, what it is? Uh, no. <laughs> so um, you have a unit of Varen guard. So it can only come from a unit of Varen guard. At the end of the charge phase, which is important, you pick a unit within 12 inches and you roll a dice for every model in the unit. For every three plus, that unit counts as scoring one less on that objective. So the reason why it's important is because at the end of a charge phase, that unit is going to be at the maximum strength that it's going to be for that phase. So if I charge a unit of 20, I'm rolling 20 dice. If I roll 15 three-ups, that unit counts for five on the objective. If I then attack them, pile in and attack them, I kill 10, they count for nothing. Mm. That makes more sense. I should have read that big block of text before we started. I was more trying to look at the <laughs> science. But I mean, I've been trying to like study the master's uh, science behind his list. Uh, I, what I didn't look at it was that. The other thing you're going to get is the failure is not an option. So you can use his command ability uh, when a friendly Knights of the Empty Throne Varen Guard unit is destroyed. If you do so, roll a dice on a 5 plus, a new unit of uh, Varen Guard with three models is added to your army. You set them up wholly within six of the battlefield edge uh, and more than nine, so they're just going to come in. And you can only use this once per phase. Yeah, so um, really good, but I've never had it work for me. <laughs> I mean, it's not that often that my whole Varengard unit dies anyway, but every time it has, I've kept a CP, I've rolled that dice, and I've never gotten a unit back. But the day I do. <laughs> do, you, do you think that's going to encourage a list that has multiple small units of Varengard? Uh, spoiler alert, by the way, Dave is taking one big block of Varengard. But for my mate Craig, uh, who likes to run, you know, four units of three, um, is that kind of incentivizing that build? Because I guess uh, if you've only got one unit of Varengard, really, like, the chances are one in three. But if you have yep. four units, there is a chance that uh, you're going to get at least one of those units back. <clears throat> yeah, the the... The play there then is that you've got to use your CP in a different way. You can't use your command points in the way that I'm going to use them. So it kind of dictates your play in a different way. Like we're not Seraphon. We're not going to have eight command points a turn. You're going to have one to two a turn. So you have to spend them wisely. And both of those command abilities are great and you want to use them. Whereas the one that reduces your um your turn scoring it's it's amazing but it's not something you're going to use every turn all the time you have to be really smart with it and you there is a really big chance of just wasting it just because oh i'll, I'll make them score less but then at the end you're still not claiming the objective so <clears throat> you have to be really smart with your cp generation i feel in this army so do you generate a lot of cp 
no. We just get one a turn. Like, so so by by dropping your so obviously you get your extra one for your battalion and if you take one yeah. for fifty points, cool. But I guess if you're building a list around failure is not an option, you're burning through your CP and you're just not spending them at another part of the battlefield. So uh, and it's only a one in three chance being a five plus. So uh, it's not a it it's not a guaranteed strategy. So uh, someone might look at that and go, Oh wow, I'm gonna get myself a unit, a free unit of Aaron Guard, but it's going to cost you a lot unless you're either super lucky or it's going to cost you a lot of CP that you're not using somewhere else. Yeah. Interesting. And do you use a lot of CP? I do. I, I generally tap my CP out in most turns. All right. So, 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 so you don't, it's not like your, your gloom spike gets and you've got like, you can lend no. people <laughs> command points for a B later, uh, which is what no. I like to do. Cause I've just got so many, I, as it gets player, I'll, I'll, I'll end up with like 12 command points at the end. I'm like, what do I do with yeah. these things? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be amazing if I had heaps of command point generation, but unfortunately it's not something that's, that's I'm in sure you Slaves would. Darkness. Uh, as, it gets player, as it gets player, I would love to have an Archeon, but I don't have one. Uh, so. Yep, yep, fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. I, think the only, I think the only army out there gets everything they want is Seraphon. Including FAQ dodges, but you have a <laughs> yeah. list. Uh, Twenty-five. So we, we, we timestamp this. We're going to talk. First off, we're going to talk about your list that went five and one at GoldCon, um, and then we'll kind of go through an alternative build. And maybe I'll, I'll get an understanding of why you chose what you chose. Because I think when I look at this, and you know, I, I look at some of these things, I'm like, well, why do we take this? You know, why didn't we take a a sorcerer lord or manticore why don't we take more units of smaller varan guard as opposed to one big block so um we'll kind of get under the hood but for the people who are joining on the podcast um it is slaves to darkness it is not to the uh, the empty throne and the first list that dave's going to talk us through is first off the leader is the knights of the empty throne varan guard it's a unit of six varan guard uh it is the general so we talked about earlier varan guard is a hero under this particular uh damned legion You've taken the in inescapable doom command trait. You've got yourself the grasping plate artifact, and you are marked Nurgle. You've got a chaos lord, which is the reap, uh, the reaper blade and the demon bound steel with the plate of perfect protection uh, artifact that's coming from the realm of Shmoon, and it's also a Nurgle. You've also got two chaos sorcerer lords. Um, did they have a spell? Do they come with a spell, or is it just like they don't get a spell? It's just the war scroll spell. They've got their Warscross spell, and then I just pick a spell at the start of every battle round. There's there's three spells that are good that I pick from. Yeah, cool. I'm, just, I'm used to most wizards having to list their, their particular spell. You've also got 20 Chaos Marauders with Axe and Shield, five Chaos Warriors, uh, Hand Weapons and Shields, five Chaos Warriors, Hand Weapons and Shield, two units of nine untaped, Untamed Beasts, so that's the Warcry, uh, Warcry Little Cultists. You've also got your uh, six Flamers of Zench, which are allies. Very interesting choice. Um, and then finally, we've got ourselves the Chaos War Shrine, Mark Nurgle, Plague Touch Warband coming in exactly 2K on the nose. Um, how many drops and and why why did you build what you build? Take me through maybe the Varen Guard and talk to me a little bit about some of the decisions you made there. Sure. So um, the list is a four drop. So it kind of teeters on the edge of it, – it's, it's in that spot where you're either going to get out-dropped by the, the one and two drops out there or Change you're going to go before, yeah. Or you're going to be able to go before nearly everything else. Not before, but choose choose the round. Um, so the Vanguard are obviously the kind of key to this list. They do a lot of the heavy lifting, and are the they're kind of the ultimate threat in the list. Uh, so being that general, they get the hero and leader keyword, um, which is great for. Uh, particular missions where those guys do more, score more, or be able to score. So the real keys here, as I said, are those command traits and that artifact. So I'll stick with the artifact first. Um, that allows me to pile in six inches from six inches away. Now that uh, kind of on the surface, if you're unfamiliar with 
AOS kind of tactics doesn't seem that good, but it's it's amazing. It dictates when you can fight with those Varengard. It essentially gives you run and charge, and it gives you retreat and charge because to pile in, you only need to be six inches away. So that artifact there gives you so much that is just hidden within it. Um, and then the other key there is the command trait, which doesn't allow you to retreat uh, when you're within three inches of the Vanguard, and that is huge. Uh, you can lock up entire sections of army, and then essentially you're dictating uh, the flow of the game and where your opponent's army is going to kind of be stuck. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, if they fly. Uh, the only things that can really get away from them are teleports out of combat, but they're fairly few and far between, uh, unless your daughters are Cain, and then you, they're everywhere. Um, so those two things together uh, make an amazing combination because you can you've got a 22 inch threat range. You can lock down parts of armies, and then you can retreat out and lock down another part of an army. Um, there's things as well like you can. Uh, it will go into it further, but so the Varengard have an ability on their War Scroll that allows them to pile in and fight twice. It's mm. not immediate, like Flesh Eater Courts, but so you've got to fight with them, let them fight, and then you get another go. But so there's things like if you pile in from six inches away, again, dictating the way that the, the fight phase is operating, and you stay that, um, just that that hair within that one inch so that um, so you, you can pile around six, say a big model like Catacross. And I did this at um, Goldcon and it was key to winning the game. I kind of piled into the side of Catacross, kept that little bit of that one, um, had an attack. And then in my second activation, because I can pile six, I managed to pile the whole way around Catacross. And then if you think of like essentially an inch, plus the two and a half inches of the night space, plus the three inches, that's like six and a half inches. So I managed to tag both of his catapults that were sitting behind. And then obviously catapults, uh, they couldn't retreat and they can't shoot me. And that takes away uh, like so much of a OBR army. Um, so you can, you can do plays like that with double pylons, six inch um, and six inch pylons. So... They're amazing. Um, they synergize so well with everything else. They're a really big, they're your general and they're also a really big footprint. So that auras that we were talking about before for like the negative one to shoot and um, the, the extra damage on sixes, that gets extended more than you could with any other hero. Because one Varen guards quite a large base and then if you got six, um, yep. that's quite a large footprint. Then you add the fact that they're five wounds a piece on a three up armor save. So your yep. general is essentially 30 wounds, a three up. Um, they, one thing I love or I hate as an opponent is the warp steel shields, which are going to ignore yep. the effects of spells and endless spells on a five plus as well. They're the things that people are going to try to do the most damage with Varen guard. Cause a lot of armies don't have high rend. Uh, you know, rend one, rend two. So you try to mortal wound them. But if you're going to ignore uh, spells and endless spells on a five plus, um, those 30 wounds are not 30 wounds. Those 30 wounds are a lot. They are. And and I'll, I'll shift into the buffs as well to make that block of six even harder to kill. They are an incredibly hard unit to kill and they're better than Archaeon in that sense of there are more points efficient Archaeon doing as much damage but more defensive. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned the shields. They ignore the spells on a five-up, which is excellent. Uh, so moving down to the Chaos Lord, this guy for me... Before, before, is... before I do that, I can't, I, I can't let you go. The chat wants to know. It's the great debate. Uh, how do you equip your Varengard? In this list, I have Demon Forged Blades. They do a Mortal Wound on a six in addition to damage. They're Ren 1. They do D3 damage. The choice there is that I don't have a lot of Mortal Wound output anywhere else in the list. 
the spells in Slave's Darkness are very short range, so I'm not slinging like um, you know arcane spells across the board or something, or like Zench. You know, it's it's not there. And there are some things that you just need mortal wounds. For instance, a Bastilladon or a Leviadon uh, with Ancient Shell that you just need mortal wounds to get through that stuff. Or Ishlayan Guard. Let, let's not forget Ishlayan Guard. Um, so that's that's my reasoning there. If I was taking something like Six Circle, I'd probably take the Ensorcelled Blades. Thank you. I know the chat was very keen on it, and I've seen this discussed many, many times. How do I best equip those Varen Guards? So um, it sounds like most of the time Ensorcelled Weapons, but in this particular build, especially requiring Mortal Wounds, um the the demon forge blades were the better option for you yeah especially again with the buffs uh <laughs> i can fish for those mortals and i can pile in twice and you end up putting out a fair a fair amount of damage um so the chaos lord uh he his main purpose in this list is to follow the varan guard and put his command ability on them which is pile in and fight twice so this allows me the option to pile in and fight twice in almost every single turn. Um, and this is where my CP kind of gets a lot of its work out. Um, but then, you know, there's some times where you're going to be out of that because they've got to be holy within 12 of the Chaos Lord. It's, it's a fairly tight aura. It's workable, but it's not. It's, it's tight. Um, there are sometimes you're going to be out of that, and that's when the Varen Guard War Scroll comes into great play where you're just like, all right, I'm going to pop the War Scroll ability this turn, and I'm going to pile in and attack twice. So th the good thing about that is, again, it it plays so well because of that six-inch pile-in again because you have to do it at the start of the combat phase. The Varen Guard don't have to charge. They're, they're not out of that range. So you can push your Varen Guard up, then you can run your Chaos Lord behind. You know exactly where he needs to be. And then he's slower than them, yes, but because of that, you're then in that range for that six-inch piling. You pop it at the start of the command phase, put it on him, boom, they pile in six later on, and they have that command ability on them. So, again, it's that synergy between the Knights of the Empty Throne and what you have in Slaves to Darkness as a faction. How often do you spend a CP to make that Chaos Lord run six? So I imagine, you know, the Chaos Lord on, because we are talking about a Chaos Lord on foot. We're not talking a mounted Chaos Lord at all. Uh, mm -hmm. It has movement five. Your Varen Guard has movement, I think it was 10 or 12. I think it's 10. 10, um, ten yeah. So it's it's probably very easy for you to move outside of your, and it's only a, a tight range. It's only a, a, holy, a holy within 12 buff. So it's a very tight range to keep your Varen Guard to be able to double pile in. It's, I think it's easier than it seems, again, because of that pile in. So if a Varen Guard unit moves uh, six on a run, so it's gone 16, um, I need to be holy within 12. The Chaos Lord moves five, so I've got uh, then 11 inches from him. So I don't actually need to run that far to keep up with that holy within 12 range. So essentially you've got a 17-inch bubble from your Chaos Lord and your Varen Guard are moving 16 with a full run, if that makes um, sense. It, it, makes, it makes perfect sense. And in my mind, I haven't seen you play this game, so, you know, I'm, I'm purely theory hammer, right? I know that my Varen Guard automatically has one double pile in that's just natural on their war scroll and i guess that could be my first time um if i'm finding i'm outside of my buff and then kind of as they're locked in combat i could be running my chaos lord up uh so i've always got that guaranteed one but if if i can keep yeah. my chaos lord in range uh then I, I guess i keep that double pile in for a later day or uh if my yeah. opponent wisens up and and, sh and and tries to take down that chaos lord because, um, you know, seven wounds, it's, it's not invincible. It can be taken no, down. It, it's, it's, it's not invincible. That's, that's correct. It, it is. So you have that screen of Baron Guard in front of it. It's probably unlikely that they're getting melee in it. Some armies can, but you have that Baron Guard brick in front of them. And then if they remain within that 12, you still that negative two to shoot. So he is, he's got more protection than not. But you're right, he can definitely be taken out. And he can definitely be taken out by spells too, which yeah. 
um, some armies can really sling. Um, but yeah, that's that's that Chaos Lord. As you said, the Vanguard like to fight, so he's actually not that far behind them in the grand scheme of things. Sometimes I do use a CP because I do need him to get up the field because the Varangard have piled in uh, too far. <laughs> but then it's the same problem with the next scroll in that... Uh, so I've run two Chaos Sorcerer Lords. Now there's a very specific reason why I've run two, uh, not one, not three. Um, you you always want to run one because of oracular visions. So that's just an ability, wholly within 12, reroll saves. Amazing. So now you're putting it on a unit of Varengard uh, with a three-up save, and now they're rerolling saves. So it's it's awesome. It's amazing. And it's just an ability. It's, uh, I just I mean, sling it, it out and say, boom. It's saving you from spending a CP uh, again, we talk about the durability of Varangard, five wounds apiece, three up armor save, uh, eating spells and endless spells and a five plus. Um, so it's just making it hard. And then you've just made it even harder by getting them to reroll once. Yeah. Um, so a Chaos Sorcerer Lord also has an amazing War Scroll spell um, and it allows you... you you one of your units within 18 um so it's a fairly decent range on this one uh and it's reroll hits and wounds and it's just reroll hits and wounds not failed it's just reroll hits and wounds so that's what i was talking about if before you sometimes you need to fish for those mortal wounds a bit more and vanguard already hit on three so they've got a pretty high chance of even if you reroll everything that's not a six to get a lot through um i don't often do it but sometimes i'm like nah i've got to i got to fish for these mortals and it can pay off and you know you put eight mortal wounds on something and then you're throwing your attacks out as well and it's um you know they're like oh, okay um so the reason for the two is there's a backup for oracular visions but oracular visions can then go on another unit that's coming up which is the marauders um so i can give them reroll saves one other thing I'll call out with the demonic power spell is it lasts until the end of the until your next hero phase. So you're going to be yep. able to take advantage of that with the double piling. So just for anyone who didn't connect the dots there, so um, it really does stack up this this uh, Varengard big block of six coming in. Uh, you know, unmovable rock, re-rolling once their armor save, eating spells, uh, double piling in, re-rolling hits and wounds. Like, it's just this absolute mad truck. If people are worried about things like uh, Gordrak or, you know, a, a, a big more crusher, uh, I think they wait till they experience. I mean, look, I've had trouble at times trying to take down three Varengard, let alone a block of six stacked to the nines like you've got here. Yeah, and there's more there's more buffs that I put on them too coming up. Um, so the two <laughs> Chaos Sorcerer Lords, the reason for that is Marauders, I find, without reroll hits and wounds, can be very lackluster. With reroll hits and wounds, Marauders become very good. Uh, and then you – so I've run two because I want to get off Demonic Power. And I also want to get off the teleport spell, which is Mask of Darkness. Uh, a unit holy within 12, pick it up, plonk it nine inches away, go for your life. So that's why I've run the two specifically. I want to get that combo of demonic power and um, Mask of Darkness off. Uh, it, if you only have one, then you can't do that. You're throwing... Because you're going to put your rerolls, on, your reroll saves onto the Varen card. So the Marauders are going in with nothing, and then at the end of the day, they might they might have a really bad roll, and then you've just thrown away twenty Marauders. If they've got reroll hits and wounds on them, if they've got reroll saves on them, and then you throw them up, suddenly they're a real threat. Um, Chaos Marauders are the next on the list. They've got an ability that I think gives them the then the name that they do as kind of a threatening unit, um, and that is they change the lowest dice roll in their charge to a six. Plus they have inherently plus one to run and charge. So you're getting a minimum, if you roll double ones, you're getting an eight-inch charge. Eight, it's an eight-inch charge, yeah. 
Yeah. Which is that's a, min that's a minimum. That's minimum. Minimum. That's not like yeah, minimum. <laughs> minimum. Like, which is bonkers, right? Like I've seen uh, people just like the way people use marauders is just absurd. Uh, obviously, when you got a larger unit, you know you're getting plus one to hit. Uh, when they're at twenty or more, they get rend one as rend well. One, yeah. Um, I think the, the burning question, like I'd I'd love for you to explain your marauder choice because one thing I want to know is why you are so conservative because people would either go a more than one unit of marauders. Two, they would go a block of 40. Man, I, yep. remember, I remember when Marauders could come in 60s. Oh, they were bad days. <laughs> yeah. And you I remember could, those days. Couldn't you buy them in units of 10 you, too? In, yeah, yeah. In the olden days, yeah. there were minimums of 10. So you could have just like many, many strings of 10. It was just a line. Yeah. 80 point, 80 point battle line. That was good. <laughs> so cheap. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah, this is a good question because I played with 40 Marauders. And I found that if I threw them out, because 40 Marauders is 320 points, that's a considerable pointed unit. Um, you know, that's like six more Sar Guard or, you know, like it's, it's, it's fairly big. Um, so if I threw them out, if I threw 40 Marauders out and say I would just crush their screens, they would then just get, crushed back because they're only a five up say they're they're a glass cannon and i just felt like ah oh, did i did i trade out enough here did i like was killing those those you know two units of and 20 skinks in the front was that worth it did i get a good enough trade there and i always came back thinking to myself well no i didn't i always felt like i threw away 320 points um which conflicted me on how to use them. Did I want to just teleport them up and throw them away? Did I want to keep them there? So I ended up playing with 20. And for me and my play style, again, you, you've, got to, you've got to figure out how you play the game yourself to, to get the most out of a list. Um, I just found that 20 was perfect. 160 points. I don't care if they get killed now. If, they, if I throw them out and if I kill that screen or if I kill their screens or if I manage to get into the back line and kill a bloody catapult or something, awesome. They get killed next turn, 160 points. Uh, they did what they needed to do. And they're a great threatening unit still at 20 because if you don't kill one, they're still rend one, they're still threes, fours. Again, if I get... Um, that was that's, that's how excited Dave is about Marauders. Because <laughs> uh, I, I think I think when I think about Marauders, uh, most people love to go those blocks of forty. And I guess when you start going into big blocks of forty, you've got the pressure of getting the value out of that. Because as you said, um, one hundred and sixty points could be another unit. It could be another hero. So, and when you start putting forty Marauders on the table, they've got uh, their opponent's going to try to go for them straight away which could be a blessing. It means that they're not going for your uh, your Varangard or uh, what you were kind of putting points into being a five-up armor save uh, might get deleted very quickly. So um, you might yeah. find people underestimate a unit of 20. They're, they're, they're more worried about the Varangard. I imagine if this yeah. list was writing at me, most people would want to go for the Varangard first. Yeah, most people do, which can be the right thing to do, but often it... Probably not. 20 is also easier to slip into places, uh, especially if I'm teleporting. Like 40 is double the size, obviously. But 20 is actually quite easy on those small bases to just put in places. Um, so uh, we played Blade's Edge, where you that's the one where you pick your... No, Forcing the Hand, where you pick your primary. Um so he picked the one that he thought was perfectly fine and I just teleported a unit of Marauders up there, killed, uh, I, I got all the buffs up, killed 10 more tech with 20 Marauders and the way that I charged, because, again, they charged so far, I think one of my dice was a 5, so there you go, I got a 12-inch charge. I charged so that just one of my Marauders was just that hair within 3 inches of one of his catapults the majority of the rest, rest went into the Mortec guard and killed them. If I had a unit of 40, I wouldn't have been able to fit them. 
I think that another good call out is you you mentioned the teleport the the setup. Anyway, I, I don't I don't want to go too much on Marauders. Marauders have had their their light in the sun. Yeah. But the fact yeah. that you're able to teleport them, and normally a nine inch charge is a twenty five percent success rate. Uh, you're able to basically make it almost a guaranteed. You know, it's uh, you're I think be it's in the mid to high nineties. It's yeah, it, it, I think it's like ninety eight percent success rate when you look at uh, the fact that your lowest dice becomes the high, uh, a six. Uh, yeah, you, you're basically guaranteed. But and then obviously you add the musician as long as you've got it. Yeah. Anything else you'd add yep. with the Marauders? I think they've been well talked about. People know Marauders. They know what they do. They're quite strong for their points. And I think you've a answered my question, which was why not 40? Yeah, they are. Look, I rate them as much as I think they're worth, which is 160 points. I'm not – I don't fluster over them. I don't think they're the most powerful unit at all. I don't even think they're close. But they are really good at the purpose that they serve. So I'll leave Marauders there. Cool. Um, that, yeah, we've, we've spoken enough about Marauders, but I want to talk about their classic Chaos Warrior. And you've got two units of five. Two units of five. They're cheap battle line, uh, 90 points for 10 wounds on a four-up save, a five-up save against mortal wounds. Like, that's pretty good for 90 points. Um, they're better than Liberators for the same points. Um and they fit that Plague Touched out really well. Um, they're good at just kind of babysitting. Again, the 90 points, I can sit a unit of five on an objective and not feel bad about not utilising them to some degree in the game. Um, but then, you know, sometimes there's there's been times where I've been like, oh, I need to go take that objective. I've got five Chaos Warriors nearby. I'll throw a bloody demonic power on them and... They go in with their, you know, 10 attacks and they they kill maybe, you know, whatever they need to do. And then so, you know, they're, they're just they're kind of workhorses in that they just do exactly what they're meant to do and they don't complain. And you haven't you haven't equipped them with the halberd and you haven't equipped them with the great blade. You've equipped them with the hand weapon and the shield, um, yeah. which is so you're going the more durable route with the five up. Uh, mortal wound yep. save as opposed to yep. any of the re-rolling or the rend that comes out with the other weapons. Yeah, the job is the job is to sit on an objective. The job is not to go and tangle with things. That's what the Baron Guard Marauders are for, uh, not the Chaos Warriors. And the starter pack came with swords and shields, and I like them. <laughs> no, they're, they're neat. And you, you're right. Like if, if you were going to want to get damage out of them you really want to be in the in the space of 10 models plus to get some of those additional benefits um so two yeah I, two. I think a really good shout is um like 15 chaos warriors and they become a very sturdy block because they just naturally reroll saves and then with that five up model wound save i think 15's definitely got its place yeah, I, I've, I've played against 15 and they were more of the traditional Chaos Warriors and uh, as opposed to like Varen Guard and Chaos Knights. And they are quite durable, they're quite strong, but you want to build around it. Speaking of tanky, I was surprised that you would take Untamed Beast because while they've got some cool abilities that I'm going to let you explain, um, the, 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 the cult unit that everyone's talking about right now is Iron Golems. They're the one that everyone seems obsessed with right now. Um, although yeah. I really like Untamed Beast for a different reason, but why yeah. why the Untamed Beast? Why not Iron Golems? And why two? So uh, I'll start with un, uh, with Iron Golems first. Is my list does not lack resilience, uh, and that's what the Iron Golems are there for. They don't move, and they reroll saves, which is you know it's it's a very good unit for ninety points. I think it's probably a bit um, underutilized unit, but more people are clicking onto it, so that's good. The Untamed Beasts, however, fill a completely different role, and that is to move up the board. They get that six-inch uh, kind of pre-scout move, uh, and there's there's multiple there's multiple uses for that. Uh, and the reason I take two is just to take up more board space, 18 of those guys can actually form quite a large area. Um, 
so they help with uh, blocking out teleports, um, uh, other kind of pre-game moves like Zilfin. Um, Zilfin have got to stay nine away when they use that. Um, it stops a lot of alpha strikes of getting straight into my lines. Um, again, most of the time I'm, I'm dictating the, the turn order being a four drop. Um, and the untamed beast pushing out just kind of allow me most of the time to go second, which going second in AOS is more advantageous than going first. Yeah, so what, what Dave's talking about, guys, is the, uh, the unleash the beast ability on the untamed beast. Uh, say beast like seven times in one sentence but basically uh it does let you run and charge which i think is a cool rule it, could, it can be quite cool but more importantly it's that second line that says in addition after armies have set up but before the first battle round begins the unit can move six inches so you get a free move regardless if dave's taking first or second so um yep. For for Caradron Overlords, you're going to push them out six inches a little bit further than they normally would, so you can help screen out some of those characters or these key units. Uh, for yep. something like Iron Jaws, it might try to charge you in turn one. It means you're going to hit that wave of um, of uh, Untamed Beasts, and then in your turn, knowing that Dave's going second, he can counter charge uh, and basically guarantee that move. Um it's obviously going to be great for deep kin and kind of blocking out where those eels can come on or flesh eater courts. And uh, I used to run Empire Archers, or they used to be free guild archers. They had the same rule, and they were very, very useful to to screen out teleports to kind of um, to push your opponent back a little further from your your juicy key targets. You want to protect that sorcerer lord, for example. So um, yeah, it's it's super key. Like the amount of uses that has is hard to portray through words it, you have to you have to see it on the table and experience the ways that it can change what your opponent wants to do or what they can do um so yeah I, i'm gonna struggle with explaining why it's so good but it is just very good to get that extra six inch buff away and especially when when you know what other people's ranges are too you can then deploy behind the line like you know you, you don't always have to deploy on the line in in um every mission uh you can deploy a little bit away and then those untamed beasts will move up six and you know then you can be like oh, well i i know that um this can't hit me because um, it's not just six, right? You've, you're then pushing a teleporting, let's say teleporting unit, let's say Caradron Overlords there, uh, or even um, even Seraphon Starborn coming from the sky. You know, let's say you've yeah. got a unit of Salamanders coming from the sky, or Caradron Overlords. Um, your Untamed Beast moves six. Then they can't be within nine inches. So six plus nine is 15. So if they have a 18-inch shot, for example, as long as you're juicy targets are you know like four or five inches behind uh behind those untamed beasts you've now pushed them out of their threat range so uh and as dave's mentioned you know earlier you don't have to deploy on your line so you could push yourself back i remember back in the day where blood uh the murder host right murder host would charge you the corn demons would charge you turn one if i deployed my army around the six inch line of the backfield i knew that a murder host could never charge my people so by understanding that, you've really kind of neutered maybe the Iron Jaws, Iron Suns turn one. You might have moved yourself out of the, the catapult range from uh, OBR. Uh, it's it's those smart decisions and, and understanding people's key threat ranges or what they can do in turn one. So I really like the Untamed Beast. I wish I saw them on the table more. Yeah, they look really cool too. <laughs> They're very cool models. Um uh, they just die a lot, so, uh, but yeah. that's their job. Um, one, one more question before we move on to the Flamers. Why not a unit of 18? So why do you do two units of nine as opposed to uh, have a, a larger, larger unit? Just purely more flexible. The first uh, two, yeah, two units of nine you can put in two different places. One unit of 18 is stuck in one. A lot of the, not a lot, but some of the battle plans these days require you to really spread across the board, like in those stepped formations kind of. If I had a unit of 18, that leaves so much of the board from the sides to come in. Two units of nine, a lot more flexibility is essentially the answer. 
yeah, I, I knew that was going to be the answer, but I thought I'd just point it out because some people might be thinking about lowering their drops or trying to work out how to, uh, what yep. to do. But the Flamers, they're, they're well, ones that I wasn't expecting to be in your list. Yeah, before the Flamers, because they're the oddball, I'll go to the War Shrine because uh, it's still okay, all right, slaves. Cool. Yep. So the War Shrine, as I said, is a really key piece for Slaves to Darkness. It has prayers that you can put out that are 18-inch bubbles, and then it's got an 18-inch degrading six-up after save. So, again, it makes your quite tanky army more tanky with the six-up after save. You're basically taking Mystical with you. The key here and why it fits so well into Nurgle, and I think the best prayer on it is Nurgle, is because of what, of what it gives you. So the... Uh, War Shrine has two different, it has a prayer for every single mark and undivided. And each of those prayers has two tiers in it. So the first tier you can put onto any unit, no matter what mark it has. The second tier only applies if you're putting that mark's prayer onto that marked unit. So for Nurgle, I would always use the Nurgle prayer. The first tier of it isn't amazing because you can get it from demonic power but it's reroll wounds cool um means demonic power can source. go in other places another source. Yep. yep and oftentimes i wouldn't put demonic on the varangard if this prayer was on them because reroll i'm hitting on threes um the second part of the so the tier two of this prayer is key and that is plus one save so we've already talked about how tanky and how resilient those Baron Guard are re-rolling three ups. Now they're re-rolling two ups uh, with a six up after save. Um, it's just, it's amazing. Like Rend 1, I'm now, I'm back to a three up re-rolling. Rend 2, which is like very good. If you've ever been hit by a unit of Morsar Guard with Rend 2, you're like, oh, that hurt. But I'm a four up re-rollable, which is uh, statistically better than a three up. Um, and then I have the six up after save. It's, it's amazing. It just makes that unit so resilient and so tanky that I can just lock down whole sections of army. And if you, I know the gold con, some of the, my games were streamed. If you look at the one against the Ideneth, I lock up like 80% of his army and it takes 80% of his army to not kill a, that unit of Varangard. And that's Ideneth we're talking about. Um, and that was through his turn three. Uh, and he had four command points. So if that doesn't tell you how how tanky this unit is and how much it's able to survive, uh, it, it's uh, it's an amazing thing. Plus, you know, I, I can't keep harping on about how good that command trait and artifact to make that Varangard unit. So just, just, just to remind the folks, we've got a unit of six Varen Guard that has a three-up armor save. If the prayer goes off, it becomes a two-up armor save. It will uh, ignore wounds. spells and endless spells on a five plus. Uh, yep. It can re-roll hits and re-roll wounds from the, the, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord. Um, yep. It piles in six inches away. It and piles in six inches and I can't retreat. So this this... It also this runs unit. and charges and retreats and charges and retreats and piles in, I should say. Runs and piles in, retreats and piles in. And it takes a lot of work to bring this down. Is there any way that you can re-roll those prayers? Because a prayer is obviously goes up on a three plus. So there's a one in three chance no. you're going to fail the prayer. But yeah. um, the turn that prayer no fails way. is the turn you go for the Varangard. <laughs> No, unfortunately, there's nothing that I can influence. It's, I, I was going to sit there and, and hope and pray that you roll a one or a two. Um, yeah, there's no way to re-roll it. So, there, um, not in not in Knights of the Empty Throne. There's not. So the the that's the War Shrine. It is key, and I often will put the second reroll saves on the War Shrine because it degrades very quickly. Um which is kind of giving away kind of a really key target that you should go for. Well, um, to be honest with you, I, but whatever. <laughs> every, every time I've played against an army with a war shrine, I've got to take it down first. I remember playing Chris. I will talk about this before we the start of the stream. I got to play Chris, Chris Tots, uh, who a, a, a local Sydney player. He used to run the plague touched and 
playing against the uh, the War Shrine and just seeing the buffs and seeing that it's, you know, making people ignore, uh, you know, things on a, a spell or an endless spell on a fire, sorry, no, a wound or a mortal wound on a six and just the, the durability, this one key piece. And the moment I can start putting wounds on it, the, the, the faster that protection of the Chaos God aura shrinks and... And it just becomes slower and slower. And for things like Varengard yeah. and Chaos Knights, um, it, it started to lose track pretty quickly. So for me, that's always been like priority number one. Um, so yeah. I guess anyone that protect your war shrine, I guess, uh, Chaos Folk. And if you're not Chaos yes. Folk, take down the war shrine. Take it down as quick <laughs> as possible. It, yeah. it's So fortunately, the prayer range does not degrade. So it can still pop out 18 inch prayers it's just the art yeah, to the, save and the movement yeah the protection of the chaos gods of the, the six up wound yep. to mortal wound yep. safe it's um so yeah i put the reroll saves on it also sometimes i will put the reroll hits and wounds on it because then it can actually put out some decent damage too but that's the war shrine so moving on to the flamers this is just a part of the army that i play around with so everything else in this army is is locked in the flamers are the kind of part I'm playing with. I found that I wanted to uh, push out and project some power across the board in shooting. Um, unfortunately, at Goldcon, they didn't really perform that well for me. So I'm not going to talk about them a lot because I'm I'm already changing them out. Um, and again, when when Slanesh, new Slanesh come out, those archers might be amazing just on their own. Uh, so I have enough points there to slip in potentially two units of those Slanesh archers. So, again, it, that's the part of my list, 280 points, which is decent, um, that I can play with. And the next iteration, I'm just going to put Bellacore and the Eightfold Doom Sigil in. Do you think it was just unlucky that you didn't get what you needed out of them? I mean, it is a, a big chunk of points. 300 points is a lot. Um, flamers are a glass cannon. You know, they've got a five-up armor save, two wounds apiece. Um, what you're really taking them for is the burdenating. So they've got a good little shooting attack. Uh, it is kind of mid-range. It's only 18 inches. And you do get some nice things, uh, especially when you've got a uh, exalted flamer within range, which you don't have. But no. Again, that's, that, that's even more points. So, um, yeah. Like, if I had 20 more points, I would have taken a unit of three Exalted Flamers. Um, I think same amount of attacks uh, and you get an extra rend. So, if. Were yeah, you if just looking for more... long rend? Were you just looking for like a shooting attack? Is that what they, they were there for? Yeah. yeah. Purely just for some shooting in the army. Um, but as I said, I don't think. They worked. And, again, like it's, I suppose, in the current meta, it's shifted towards a lot of, like, power coming from smaller units or single units, I find. Um, trying to think if I'm talking crap here, but, like, you, maybe, maybe, like, 40 skinks is something that a unit of flamers would be good against because it's hitting on twos and it can really push out some damage then. Other than that, I mean, you've got more tech guard, which are kind of in 20s, but they're a three-up save because they're under Catacross. Um, and then the damage that you do is probably just going to be healed back. <laughs> um, yeah, you've got like Empty Thrones, Ideneth, which you're just not really doing anything against. So I, I don't know. Like they can have their place and they can do well. They're Flamers of Zench, but they don't have all of the kind of buffs that you get inherently in Zench, um, like the Exalted Flamers, the Extra Rend, and the Winning on Twos from the that mm. specific change host. So I'm going to take him out. I'm going to put in Bellacor. Uh, we all know about Bellacor. He's really good. I was going to I was gonna ask what would it take to, get, to bring in Bellacor into this list, being that uh, I guess one of the reasons you'd bring in the Flamers is to be able to take down a Lord Croak uh, or a Teclas, or someone in a backfield castle that you just need to take away and they're kind of just flooding the board with models to stop you. Um, but yep. another way to handle that is just to straight up tell them no. Uh, you know, darkness yeah. like, it's like straight up no, no, Lord Croak, you can't cast that spell. No, you can't yep. move. Um, 
Yeah, look, I played with Bellacor many a times, and he's always been amazing and clutch. And six flamers won't kill Croak or Techless. They're just not going to do it. Croak's, Croak's too good. He's almost invincible. And Techless uh, is <laughs> kind of kind of the same. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the flamers. I, I Yeah, it just didn't work for me. Experiment with your lists, though. It's it's good to do it. Try different things. Um, this is kind of the third iteration of that spot. And, yeah, Bellacore is just kind of going back in. And, again, in saying this, guys, uh, Dave did go 5-1 and one with this at a recent real-life tournament. So uh, I know you're being a little bit hard on yourself that you didn't get the value out of the Flamers, but uh, you did go 5-1. and one. So that's 300 points that you could be spending elsewhere, whether it's in a hero, whether it's boosting up those Chaos Warriors as Marauders, another unit of Varengard, or manipulating somewhere. Uh, so um, that's pretty cool that you've got the flexibility as well to kind of tweak it and make it better despite going 5-1. Yeah. and one. <laughs> yeah, another unit of three Baron Guard is also a good shout in, in this. They're, they're just good. Um, yeah. So everything except the Flamers and the two Untamed Beasts are all wrapped up in this Plague-Touched Warband. And I mentioned before that I think it's one of the best battalions. Um, reason, One of the main reasons is you need to take a Nurgle hero and then seven Nurgle model units. So it's so free and relaxed in what you need to take. It doesn't specify other than a hero. You're already taking a hero and seven it's super units. super flexible. That is such a yeah. flexible battalion. Yeah. So you can, you can kind of make, you can create so many different lists within this battalion and it still work. And then its abilities on top of it are very good. Um, and it, this will, again, really kind of, force your opponent to make decisions that he would otherwise not have to make and not like. Um, so the main ability is any unmodified six to wound against one of your units in the Plague Touch Battalion does a mortal wound back. So, so every single so six you, they do. Yeah, it's not you attacking and your sixes do a mortal wound. It's when they hit no. you, they yep. roll a six to wound, uh, you will dish a mortal wound back to them. Yep. So things like... Uh, Ishlayan Guard, Mortec Guard, which are very tanky against normal hits, not so tanky against mortal wounds, but both of them put out a lot of attacks. They will generally go into my Varen Guard. They're forced to hit me because uh, I'm in combat with them. They can't retreat from me. I'm in their grill. They're forced to hit me. They start taking mortal wounds back. I take no damage. They take models off the board doing attacks against me. It's... Um, <laughs> It's pretty rude. And this goes back to what we were saying about this this unit of 30 wound Varengard. Uh, it's not 30 wounds. Like, it's just, it's probably closer to 60 when you think about just the value that you're getting from all, all of it. Yeah, yeah. So that's essentially the list. And I, I kind of hope I've portrayed how much slaves to darkness and knights of the empty throne is all about synergies between the units and the buffs and the auras that you put out and the way it all kind of combos together to just make this kind of freight train it's a death star like the list is a death star um but it's you've got, got a lot these... of points a lot of points are going into making that that um that unit of varangard just unstoppable Yes, yes. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a really good list. Uh, it works in the current meta. It plays in the current meta. It could compete with all of the top lists. Um, you know, you're going to struggle against, say, like the old Daughters of Cain. New Daughters of Cain is coming out, so we'll see what happens there. But you're going to struggle against, like, the Seraphon still. You're going to have hard games against Ideneth. You, you're going to have these really hard games against the top lists but you are going to enjoy the ride, let's say, of the game. And when you do beat those top lists, it is a um, an OBR as well. Um, it is kind of a fulfilling win. It's not like you've just autopiloted your way through it. You still There's so many rules in it. Like it took me so many games to remember all the rules, all the buffs, all the auras, all the ranges, 
everything that I needed to do because if you miss one of those steps or one of those things isn't in the right place, things start to kind of, the wheels start to kind of fall off. So it's a list that you need to play with multiple times, but once you start to get really well-versed in it, it, it really pays off and it's uh, fairly rewarding, I think. Two questions before we move to the other list. Um, and you have, yeah, I, I think you've absolutely given this list justice. Actually, I have three questions. First, uh, who was the loss that you, or what was the army that you lost to? And was it just a hard counter or do you think that you got outplayed or you did, you just made some mistakes? Uh, I played against Corey um, Papanini. That makes sense. He, yeah. Yeah. So he won the event. Um, he was playing Daughters of Cain. Uh, and it was a combination of Marathi teleporting and 20 archers um, shooting in the hero phase and the, the snakes, snakes, and snake, the shooting snake, phase. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the snake Melusi or whatever they're called. Um, the Calibron, the Calibron that's changing in a few weeks. Yeah, so I could probably go on for another hour about how messed up that book is, <laughs> but it's changing soon, so whatever. That list, yeah. I've I've had a few practice games against. Like Corey's one of my regular kind of gaming um, buddies, I knew that I probably wasn't going to beat it, to be honest. I did make a mistake in the game as well. That just allowed him to beat me even harder. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that list just counters so many things because it does so many things that the game isn't built for. So well, it does a lot of things. It's Marathi, for example. Like she can only take three wounds, so there's straight up one yeah negation of one of your key and you've got so many things kind of synergizing and re-rolling hits and wounds so yeah. it kind of negates that value that you've you've tried to build out yeah ex exactly and the amount of mortal wounds you can put from range hurts me and you know it was it was a very hard match i tried and but after i made that really key error i won't go through it because it'll take me a while i can see my battery going very dead um <laughs> But it's, I made a really key error with the movement of my Varengard. And as I said before, you've really got to get this list down because piling in six is not the same as charging. Charging, you can move in any direction. Piling in, you need to pile in to the closest enemy. So that is, that's actually really key with your movement. You have to ensure that you've put yourself in a position where you can pile in where you want to. And it allows your opponent to play in the game in such a way that they put them their models that you have to that, that they can kind of dictate your pile-ins. So be really careful with that. And again, that comes down to practice with the list. So that was my that was my loss. That's yeah. Look, and, and that kind of leads into my last question. And I might actually, what I might even do, Dave, if, if, if that works for you, is I can read out the second list if you want to put your phone or your laptop on charge. The <laughs> yeah, last I'm just burning question. myself. The last burning <laughs> question I had is almost like a, it always kind of like a follow on from that. To take down your Varen guard, if I wanted to kill your Varen guard, or maybe as a, a Slaves to Darkness player, what are you most afraid of? Is it those things like mortal wounds at range? Um, that you can't, well, it's harder to negate or some of these rules like, you know, your, your two up armor saves and things like that are just not going to play, especially like, you know, the the, the five up uh, ignoring spells and endless spells because those those wardens shooting, the snakes, um, any any mortal wounds from range, is that kind of like the, the bane of your list? Yes, it is one of them, yeah. So the Vanguard don't have a natural mortal wound save, unlike... Um, Chaos Knights and Chaos Warriors, they have the ignore the spells. Um, so, yeah, if you can put a lot of mortal wounds on them from range in the shooting phase, not the, yes. yeah, not yeah, the yeah. spell phase, um, it, it really does start to stack up and hurt. And I have played against a Lumineth list with, like, 70 archers in it. And I was just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the big thing in the UK, and they'll just they'll do re-rolls to hit. And just fish for those sixes and just do because they, they ignore line of sight as well. They're just brutal. Yeah, those fives and sixes. I In the game that I did play against that, if I had won, because it goes before me because it's one of these one drop or two drop lists. Um, 
So it kind of went first so that it could put out a bunch of stuff. It did, and it hurt. And at the end of turn one, I had two Vanguard left. But if I had won that turn into turn two, it really would have allowed me to come back into the game because um, then I could have retreated out, gotten into Sentinels and started doing some hurt and pushing Marauders into them. So it's not an auto loss. I, I'm very... Like, it's one of the things that I always say, it's one of the reasons I like AOS so much, is I feel like any any decent list has a chance on any given day to win. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. And I, and I thought I'd just point that out, just in case people are like, what, what what's the biggest threats to me? And it's not the shooting, it's not the rend, it's not the magic, it's going to be shooting mortal wounds in the shooting phase, so... Uh, yep. against snakes, uh, wardens as two examples of that. Yeah, uh, Dave, you on charge? I am, yes. All right. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> all right. If I well, use more than I can charge. Uh, we should be all right because the second list is similar but a little bit different, so we can kind of fast track a little bit of this. But uh, the second alternative build that you've got for us to flex a muscle and show us maybe a different way that you might write your list so we've got a similar kind of thing. We've got Slaves uh, to Darkness, Knights of the Empty Throne, and the second list includes a unit of three Varen Guard, one's a General with Inscapable Doom. Again, uh, we then have two additional units of Varen Guard. So we've got three units of Varen Guard in total. They are all heroes under the em Knights of the Empty Throne. Uh, one has the artifact of the Grasping Plate. One has the artifact of Corrupted Nullstone. Nullstone. Uh, you've also got two Chaos Sorcerer Lords as well as 20 uh, Chaos Marauders with Flails, 20 Marauders with Flails, five Chaos Warriors with the Hand Weapon and Shields, Double War Shrine, Play Touch Warband. So I imagine all of our units are as normal marked by, uh, they're all marked uh, Nurgle. Mark Nurgle, yeah. Cool. Those Marauders as well. Don't take Flails. That was That's just the first option in War Scroll Builder. I didn't change that. <laughs> Always take Shields and Axes. So opinion. talk to me about the three units of Varangard. You've got three units of three Varangard. So we've gone a more multiple small unit as opposed to a big block. Um, yeah. How does this differ to what you shared with us previously? So, yeah, this is just more MSU. This is spreading around and punching out. So you've got a bit of play with your Varangard where one can kind of charge in, tie up units, and then the other one can pile from that six away so you can – you can kind of have that one-two punch. Um, all of them uh, have their scroll ability to pile in twice. The other one's kind of just like a, a, a backup unit on the, the one-two punch, I feel. But, I mean, three Varangard is still really good. You probably don't want to put three straight into the line because one's going to be unbuffed. Uh, so you have the two Chaos Sorcerer Lords. Again, this is kind of like a MSU one-two punch combo. So the Chaos Sorcerer Lord puts the reroll saves on two units of Varangard. You have the two War Shrines, so you can get off, hopefully, the two prayers on those two units of Varangard. So you've still got um, you've still got that two-up rerolling uh, saves, rerolling wounds, um, and then the other Sorcerer Lord can kind of uh, teleport the the Marauders around. Um, and then I just tried to put more Marauders in there just for a bit more bodies. Um, so, like, I haven't tested this list. I just kind of tried to come up with another Knights of the Empty Throne list that could potentially work um, that is kind of on a completely different tangent to the way I'm doing it, where I'm doing a Death Star, everything buffing that Death Star and everything's kind of playing around it. This is more of like a spreading power over multiple different places you've got five units there that can all do work and do things and this allows you to just play everywhere on the board it's not as powerful as the single unit but yeah you can go different places yeah i was, I was gonna say that um this is more about spreading out your power across the board um so uh, it, it's fun and it's interesting and you might actually as well use that CP to bring back a Varen Garden. You've got enough units to hopefully get one back. Uh, but I, I guess with so many different power centers of powers across the board, you're going to spend me your CP anyway. 
re-rolling hits, uh, especially because you've only got two Chaos Sorcerer Lords. So one of those units are going to be unsupported uh, at yep. some point. Yeah. And this list, because you're not using your CP on the Chaos Lords ability, um, you can much more kind of freely either save up for those five up return a unit uh, or the minimize their scoring, which you can uh, kind of use in a lot more places with three units around the place. No, that's fair. That's fair. And I think there's, um, like, when we look at the different builds, there there are so many different ways that you can uh, manipulate uh, an army like this. You know, you could you could bring in Chaos um, chaos Knights. You could, uh, as we've mentioned, bring in Bellacor. Uh, one thing I've really grown to appreciate uh, recently is the Chaos Marauder Horsemen. Um, and bringing them into a Slaves of the Darkness list. So I think the, you know, if you're playing with speed, you're playing with synergy, there's so much you can do here. And as we've mentioned earlier, the Plague Touch Warband is just so flexible in what you can put into it that um, you can season to taste however you want to build your army. Yep. Yep. Multiple different lists in that battalion. You've obviously played this for a while now and um, you've got some good experience. You've played against some of the hard-hitting meta. You know, we've got the Seraphons, we've got the Lumineth, we've got Zench, we've got KO. They're, you know, some of the harder armies right now. Uh, you've obviously got to play a whole bunch of different armies. What what did you learn or what's, what's some of the things that you've kind of appreciated now that you've had some good game time going into uh, your next tournament that we're going to meet at? Uh, hopefully not me that at least I would not want to play this army with my gargants because uh, double parting in against my gargants are going to pull them down very quickly. Yeah, what do they have, 20 or 30 wounds? Uh, 35, 35, 35 wounds, Mega Gargant's got a four-up armor save, <laughs> so you, you'll pull them down pretty quickly, and I can't use any of my abilities like stuffing you in my pants because uh, you've got too many yeah. wounds. Yeah, I think I could probably kill a gargant. In a round double pile in, the double the the, the the six yeah. the six Varen guard would probably pull down a mega gargan on the charge with the double pile in with all the stacked buffs like you'd you you do it you would do it, yeah. And the Ren's not getting through me. Oh, I know your attacks would hurt yourself too. So, <laughs> uh, I, I, Gargan's got a lot. Gargan's have a low amount of attacks, but they're high rent, okay. so. So I, yeah, I, I've right. got that much. I've got that much on me. But well, like, what have yeah. you like, like? What have you learnt, or like, what have you found by playing them that maybe wasn't as obvious for someone who's picking this up for the first time and maybe, you know, exploring their battle tome? Um, I guess it really makes you good at the movement phase. The movement phase just the movement phase is already the most important phase in the game. Uh, it's just ultimately important in this list. If you stuff up your movement phase, it'll just fall flat on its face. So I guess, yeah, it's it's definitely made me better, it made, made me play better in the movement phase, which, you know, as I said, is the most important phase. So <laughs> I already valued it pretty highly. Yeah, this this game is one in the deployment and the movement phase. Like, if you make a poor deployment or if you don't take advantage of the movement phase, you will put yourself out of the game very quickly. So, um, yeah. and and yeah, like I think you you pointed it out earlier in list one was that uh, because you've got a couple of synergies that are short range, those twelve inches as opposed unholy within twelve. Um, mm. I think being being very careful and deliberate and making sure that you don't move out of a synergy because you are putting so many points into that unit of Varengard. Yeah, yeah, you got to be hyper aware of where everything is and where everything needs to be. So it's sometimes, and not sometimes, I'm going to say regularly, I will have to use the teleport on one of the other Chaos Sorcerer Lords because my Varengard have moved too far up and they're out of the 12 of the reroll saves. So there's, you know, probably once every two games, twice every two games, I'm teleporting a sorcerer up to put those reroll saves under the Varangard. Where's the teleport coming from? I don't think we've actually called that out. 
Uh, it's one of the spells that the the slaves of darkness have access to. The mask of darkness. Yeah. Yeah, because it wasn't listed on your. Yeah. It wasn't yeah, listed. Yeah. Uh, but I know we've talked about it, but we haven't explicitly said where it came from. So uh, there's a spell law, and one of those spells is a teleport. It's anywhere on the board as long as it's outside of nine, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Um, any other spells that you like, or are you are you doubling down on that spell? Um, there's two other decent spells. One is like a horde spell. So you roll a dice for every model in the unit. Six up does a mortal wound. If you do any wounds if any wounds get through the unit can't move pretty powerful um the other one is fights last so again they're both 12 inch range they're they're really short range that's blinding damnation where yeah they fight at the end of the combat phase yep so that can that can be handy for double piling in varangard if you manage to get in range and get it off they don't get to attack and you get two attacks so then you start Pretending you're Gristle Gore. Have you played uh, Have you played Fire Slayers yet with these guys? I haven't. No. How do you think you'd That's go? One. Um, potentially, I could go all right because I I would get to dictate kind of where I'm going to fight because uh, they're they're going to try push up onto me as they do. If I go into the side of them. I can get a lot of attacks in, whereas they potentially won't. Now, again, this is just theory because I haven't, I haven't sure. had a stack up I against mean, them. In but theory, being able to retreat. Them. Yeah, in theory, they got no chance. I'd just crush them underfoot and uh, walk away. Um, that look, Vice Lays are still really good, and uh, they'd be a tough matchup. But if I got Bellacor in the list, oh, if I lock down one of their units, even if you picked their little, um, the hero that's got to move up with them, like that could lock them down too. Yeah, I was going to say, like the challenge with Fire Slayers is you've got to have the, the the range to take out the hero sitting behind, and that's where maybe Flamers would have been kind of perfect for that. And I guess mm. with your Demon Forge Blades coming in, they would be quite good to, to handle the the chaff, you know, the Hearthcar Berserkers. But then you add in, as we said, the um, Bellacor and maybe a 5-up, you know, stop, and that's a very short range as well. I guess I wanted to point out, like, that's probably another meta army that uh, we didn't speak about, and yep. um, maybe why you'd want, sh you know, some shooting attacks to to be able to get across. But um, yeah, Bellacor is definitely a good shout. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I played every other kind of top tier list um, except Fireslays. Do you get the eyes of the gods as well? Do you get the ability to like, that you kill? No, and... no. I played one practice game where I did, and it was amazing. And I was just like, I thought it was the best. I was so keen. I even printed out a bit of paper with the the table on it, and then um, I reread it, and it said you have to have the keyword eyes of the god. Yeah, because the idolaters, <laughs> the idolaters just got the eyes of the god, but I didn't think you got it. I wasn't sure. No, nah, I don't. That on Varangard is so good, and it was so good. Well, that's why I asked you because I'm like, oh, like, you know, your Varangard's probably charging into heroes and having the ability to take down and potentially get yourself a Demon Prince um, would have been quite sexy or bringing in, you know, 10 Plague Bearers or, you know, some Blood Letters or Demonettes or some Pink Horrors. But yeah, uh, no, yeah. let's not talk about that any further because you don't get it. Well, I, I did roll for it once at Goldcon. My Chaos Lord killed, got the final strike on Marathi in the game I lost. Uh, I was so pumped. I rolled it up and I rolled a nothing happens. Uh, so uh, pretty anticlimactic from the uh, Chaos Gods there. I think it was because the game I lost, they just weren't interested. I mean, yeah, you're getting your butt kicked by Marathi. That doesn't, there's like, oh, cool. <laughs> change the channel and see what's on the NFL. Yeah, um, yeah. Is there any other thing that you've kind of picked out? I mean, you've, you've shared so much great wisdom already, uh, Dave, the power stance. Cur. If anyone gets a chance to watch Dave, you know that he's in the zone when he takes his shoes off and gets in this amazing power stance. That's um, <laughs> I remember commentating the Masters in 2018 or 19 and just watching you with your power stance. It was a thing of absolute beauty uh, watching yeah. you handle and uh, win that event. You won that event. Um, 
Yeah. I think he beat Chris Welfare on stream in the last game. I think it was from memory. Yeah, I did. Yeah, it's it's part of the routine. It gets gets in people's heads, you know. It's part of the mental game that happens in the background. <laughs> the, pow- the power stance. But is there anything else you'd want to add yeah. to this? I mean, this was really cool. I uh, I was already scared of, of Varen Guard in blocks of three. A unit of six stacked the way you stacked in our first list is just um, – is terrifying me if we ever meet uh, or someone clones this list. But is there anything else you'd want to add before we kind of bring it home? Not really. I think I've discussed most of it. It's it's my kind of favourite way to play in Slays of Darkness and probably the way that's going to compete with all the, the top boys. So um, I'm going to take it to Brizhammer. I'm thinking about taking it to uh, Bendigo, Vic, Vic GT. Um, but we might bring out some other secret sauce, Vic GT. I mean, as, as, as someone who has five war scrolls and three ways to build his army, uh, I have no secretless <laughs> tech. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm going to run forward and just do my thing. But uh, yeah. I think, you know, like regardless of how you guys and anyone who's listening to this, um, this is one of many ways to build it. Dave's list is not the only way to build Knights of the Empty Throne. Season to no. taste. Get yourself the Lord on Kakadrak. Bring it in, in in Slanesh or Nurgle. Who knows what the new Heed Knights of Slanesh is going to bring and how they're going to synergize with Slaves to Darkness. Uh, bring in Corn if Corn gets an update through Broken Realms. Mara- oh, Marathi maybe it's Broken Realms. Who who knows what what Corn might get buffed? But uh, this is just one way that you've taken the rules and incorporate them into a competitive list. So uh, take the theory and and, and use what you want. Uh, It's no one way to do the list. Although you did go five and one, so uh, shout to you. It's a good place to start, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, your list is not a five and one list. You know, you obviously practiced, you have a very good uh, grasp of the game. So don't think you're going to pick this up or win the next GT, guys. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, practice, 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 nice. practice. But da- Dave, I know that you are a member of a fruit based organization. Is there anyone that you'd want to shout out at this particular point? Uh, s- strawberries, kiwi fruit. Uh, look, yeah, I'll, I'll shout out the Mango Mafia. Uh, that is my affiliate AOS club up here in um, sunny Queensland. Brisbane's Brisbane's the main hub, but we've got members throughout. Um, so I'll shout out the Mango Boys, uh, all the other clubs in Queensland. You know, nah, not even going to give them a mention. <laughs> uh, I did see your dad was in the chat earlier as well. So shout out, Dad. Thanks for uh, supporting sure your son. Yeah. yeah. Shout out, shout out to Wes. If I don't shout him out, he'll, um, he'll, he'll hit me up. So shout he'll, out to Wes. The uh, king of the yeah, North. Out, there you go. I even called him to, the king of the North. <laughs> so the joke the joke here, guys, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is uh, so in that, that the Masters, uh, so I was commentating a full weekend of the Masters and um, there was this guy in the in the Twitch chat and uh, he was saying, you know, he was talking up like, you know, Dave, where's my son? I want to hear my son talk about Dave. And I'm like, I didn't know where's at this particular point. So I legitimately, I mean, I'm on, I'm on air. I, I, I got to trust everyone. So I'm like, okay, cool. This is Dave, Dave's dad, and uh, he's like talking him up, like you know. I'm like, oh, it's cool. You know, family's here to support your son watching Warhammer. And then I find out it's Wes, and I meet Wes, and I'm like, oh. yeah. But but good times, <laughs> good times. Wes, Wes and the Mango Mafia, the wonderful hosts, biggest, good people, biggest troll on the net. Uh, I'll, never, I'll never forget Gammy in, in uh, laying in bed, <laughs> eating a juicy mango, uh, I think shirtless. Do you think he sent me that picture? And like, that's enough, guys. Please no more. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Dave, the two-time Australian master, thank you so much for your time. Um, this was awesome. Uh, Dave's list, by the way, are in the episode description. So if you do want to see two of those lists, um, please, you know, feel free to check them out and kind of see some of the, the secret sauce. If you have a... If you have an alternative thought, if you think there's a, a better way of building this list, I'm sure Dave would appreciate hearing. But, like, leave some comments. Let us know what you're thinking. Uh, maybe Definitely. some synergies. You know, you're using the iron golems for the teleport. I know people are talking about taking a big block of 28 iron golems and using this spell to teleport them up the board. But your build probably doesn't need that that duration. So, no, uh, they'll get him. Durability, way. not duration, durability. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, Dave, I'm going to let you go now. Thank you so much. Uh, and also shout out to Andy as well, who just became a member of the channel. So thank you so much. Uh, that means a lot. But guys, this was awesome. Dave, I'll let you go. You can, you can go have some dinner now. I know it's uh, it's late. Yep. But uh, thanks, shaking, guys. So. <laughs> go <laughs> Hold go my phone go. for the last 20 minutes. It's just... Oh, you're a wild man. All right, we're going to wrap <laughs> it up, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Let us know, uh, comments, all that good stuff. See ya. I hope you found that See discussion guys. valuable. If you did, give the video the old thumbs up. And if you have a comment or an insight, leave it in the comment section below. The champions over here are my AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members. So you guys are bloody legends. Thank you for all the support. If you want to know more about the support programs, the links are below down here in the episode description, along with a link to the Discord server, so we can continue this conversation. Until next time, don't forget to name your characters and have a good one.